morning, New Life family. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are so excited today to bring you our all church service. We have gathered all our 28 New Life Chicago land locations to bring you a powerful time of worship and a powerful message. Right now, down below, give a shout out from your home church or your city that you're watching from. And take this time right now to share the link with your family and friends. You don't want to miss it and you don't want them to miss it as well. As you can see behind me, we have our worship team that has united from all our New Life locations to bring you a spirit-led worship time. We will also be hearing a powerful message from our senior pastor, Mark Job. We will be having communion today, so go ahead, grab your crackers, grab your juice, and prepare your hearts for communion. Thank you, New Life. You don't want to miss this, and I hope that you enjoy the service. And welcome to New Life Online. I'm Pastor Galen. And I'm GP. And we are Ask the Pastor. We're so glad to have you here joining us online today. And even though we can't be together, we're still staying connected while we stay safe and stay home. You know, we've been doing church online for a while now. We have learned a few important things along the way. Our first priority for every online service is your safety. So before we start, we want to give you a few safety guidelines, recommendations, suggestions, tips. Yeah. How about five pro tips for how to have church at home. <laughs> Number one, be sure all items such as Bibles, notebooks, pens are all safely stored on a nearby table or desk. You might need these at some point during the service once the pastor gets preaching. Can I get an amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Number two, please on all your electronic devices such as mobile phones, tablet, watches, earbuds, laptop, desktop, and TVs on. Come on. <laughs> The goal is to add the Sabbath playing on many devices as possible. N -n -n Number three, Wi-Fi. We encourage you to connect to Wi-Fi to watch the service without interruption. 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 That being said, you may experience some turbulence throughout the service. Just take a deep breath. Have a refresh in the paint, or video, or app, or screen. For first class seats, we know you paid a little bit extra. So go ahead and grab those VR glasses and put them on. And if you really want to bless that family member who loves the first row seat and wants the extra blessing of the pastor's spirit, pastor, speak to them, pastor. Here we go. Can I get an amen, church? Oh my God, can I get a t-shirt? Thank you. Number four. Please remain seated at all times until it's time to worship. During worship, we invite you to stand, sing, sway, close your eyes, or raise your hands. Turn the volume up so high so you can participate in worship. Oh, and if you need to use the restroom at any point in time, feel free to do so. Just please, please, and please do not take your phone with you. That's just... Number five, our in-service meal today will include some juice and crackers. We'll be partaking communion together at the end of the service. So please prepare some elements. Any type of juice and cracker will be fine. Just keep it simple. There you have it, our five pro tips for having church at home. Today's service will be about 82 minutes and 25 seconds. So get ready, fasten your seatbelts, and as always, thank, thank you, you for, for worshiping with us at New Life. Hey, good morning, New Life. We're glad to worship together this morning. So come on, why don't you join us this morning? Here we go.
Sing praise, sing the name of Jesus in this place. Yes. You're worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. He's worthy of every breath we could ever God is our strength. Él es la ayuda siempre presente en nuestras tribulaciones. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way, aunque caigan las montañas, en el fondo del mar, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams alegran la ciudad de Dios, the holy place, where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her. Dios la ayudará al clarear la mañana. Se agitan las naciones, se tambalean los reinos. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and he shatters the spear. Ha arrojado los carros al fuego. He says, be still and know that I am God. And I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty, he is with us. El Dios de Jacob, he is our fortress.
give you the honor in this place and we say you are worthy. You're worthy of every song, every breath that comes out of our lungs. Jesus, we give to you and we say you're worthy. Jesus, you're the name above every other name. And so we build our life upon the foundation of your love. It's the name of Jesus that we worship and we pray and the church together says, amen and amen. Welcome, New Life family. I'm Pastor Josiah, and as you've noticed already, today we have a special service in store. New Life is one church that meets in 28 different locations. Locations that are in neighborhoods like Lincoln Park, Lakeview, Hammond, Hobart, Montclair, Cicero, Midway, Elgin, Montgomery, and a lot more. We are all over the city for the good of the city. During this season, it's been challenging for a lot of us, but I've been blown away as your pastor, so proud and thankful of, of how our church has really stepped up to be light in such a dark and challenging time. One area specifically that I wanna thank our church for is in the area of generosity. I wanna say thank you for being so generous in this difficult and challenging time. And I wanna encourage you to continue being faithful to continue being faithful with what God has entrusted you with. As you give this morning, whatever you've decided in your heart, there will be a link on the screen to give. And I wanna remind you specifically to make sure that you click on the location in which you attend and make sure you give to that location specifically. While we were giving this morning, our team has put together a really special video that highlights how New Life Community Church the people of God, us, have been a light in such a dark and challenging time. Check out this video. At the start of this pandemic, we as a church asked ourselves the question, how do we minister to people during this time? How can we be the church and demonstrate the love of Christ? How can we be a light in our city? We believe every challenge we face and every obstacle is an opportunity for God to demonstrate his power and love in our lives. We started online services so we could continue to worship and hear the word of God and remind people that in the midst of the storm, we are never alone. Small groups began meeting online to encourage one another and pray and stay connected. Our children's ministry continued online with weekly kids zone services, crafts, and even a time for show and tell. We visited frontline workers and first responders, sending care packages, notes of encouragement filled with lots of love and prayer. On a quiet Easter morning, while parking lots, auditoriums, and sanctuaries sat empty, we celebrated the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus in thousands of homes across Chicagoland. And then, something miraculous happened. The church exploded and responded in a big way. We gave to the work of New Life Centers to help feed families in need. What started with a few hundred families grew to feeding over 4,000 families every week. To help meet the need, we expanded our food pantry from one site to seven sites throughout the city. Hundreds of volunteers rolled up their sleeves and put on their masks to distribute thousands of food boxes. The lines were long, but God provided all that we needed. 
And we couldn't let this time go by without saying thank you to you, our New Life family. Thank you for serving as the hands and feet of Jesus in a great time of need. Thank you for sharing the good news, for being the church and a light in our city. Thank you for your faithfulness in praying, giving, and supporting our church. There's much more to come, and we can't wait to see what God will do next. Wow, what an amazing, amazing story that has been. If you can't get excited about what you saw in that video, then we need to jolt you into being alive. God has done some incredible things at a difficult time. Good morning, New Life. I'm so excited to be able to address you today. Uh, this is a special day, as has been said already, and I'm excited to see what God is going to do through this. I want to say it's a special day on a couple of fronts. One, it's an all-church gathering. We're giving our pastors a little bit of a break, and we're talking together as a family. The second reason it's a special day is actually today's my anniversary. That's right. I've been married to my beautiful bride for 34 years. And uh, let me tell you a little story about that. I was 21 years old when I got married, and I was all excited about this wedding day, pumped up about uh, jumping into this mega transition in my life. And so my father actually uh, married us, and we went out, uh, walked out down the steps of the church while people threw rice at us, because in those days you threw rice, got in the car with cans uh, clanging behind us and decided to drive around the neighborhood. And so I was looking at my bride thinking, this is such a powerful, great moment to celebrate. And we stopped at a stop sign and a guy with a brown bag in his hand said, hey, buddy. And I thought he was going to say, congratulations. I rolled down the min window and said, yes. And he said, you just made the worst decision of your life. And he took another drink. And so that was his celebration. And here's what I knew. I knew that he must have made a decision in his life that had turned out very, very bad. I want to say this. We have been through a very, very bad season. But I'm glad that we as a church decided to tackle what I call the trilogy crisis in a way that would honor Jesus. And so, what do I mean by a tri trilogy crisis? Well, there's three crises of enormous magnitude. In fact, we haven't seen crises like this in a hundred years, and they've all hit us in a period of four months. What am I talking about? Well, at first of all, it started four months ago with the health crisis, the global pandemic, like a world hasn't seen in a hundred years since the Spanish flu. Uh, this global pandemic infected so far 7.5 million people. Deaths have already reached 423,000 and in the U.S. 112,000. Unprecedented. And right after that, like a domino that hits another domino, we went into a financial crisis. We had to shut down our economy and uh, this economic recession hit 40 million Americans that filed for unemployment. The U.S. suffered job loss not seen since the Great Depression. In fact, studies say that one in every five households were deemed food insecure. That's a fancy word, but fancy way of saying that one in every five households weren't sure where they were going to get their next meal. And then about the time that we thought we were sort of raising our head out of that, we were hit with another crisis, the racial crisis. Globally, this is spread throughout the entire country, ignited by the images of George Floyd's brutal death. Protests erupted all over the United States of America, pointing to the disparities and inequalities, especially in the African-American communities around our country. It's been one crisis after another crisis after another crisis. And I don't know about you, but I've been asking myself, God, what are you doing 
through these crises. And that's what I really want to talk about today. What is God doing in crisis? Before I jump into the passage and what I think has a prophetic message to it, let me simply say that our congregation has been hit hard. I know six people that have died through COVID-19, including people from our church. In fact, just this past week, a dear sister from our Midway location, 68 years old, Rita, you would see her as one of the greeters when we had services, uh, she passed away from COVID-related complications. Our hearts have been grieved uh, by so many people that have been in the hospital. I know families that have been deeply affected by the economic crisis and people that have been laid off and have had to really go through our food distribution because they weren't sure how to pay the mortgage and how to put food on their table. This has been a very, very, very challenging time. And we've seen the pain, the grief, the frustration in our city, in our country over the racial uh, tensions, the inequality that it's brought to light. All of us have been affected one way or another, all of us one way or another by these crises. I want to say also to our pastoral team, I'm really proud of how our pastoral team and leadership team has stepped up to the plate during this crisis time. This hasn't been a time where people have closed the doors and buried uh, themselves in a study. This has been a time where our pastors have rolled up their sleeves throughout all of our locations and have said, we're in a time of crisis. God, help us to respond the right way. Help us to minister the right way to people that are sick, uh, people that are economically hurting, and um, people that are grieving over inequality and brutality in our streets, and how do we come alongside people in the midst of this crisis? But I've been asking myself, God, what are you doing, and how can we respond? You know, from the beginning of this crisis, there has been a, a story, an image, that I could not shake in my spirit, and I believe it's the spirit of God impressing this upon me, almost from day one of the crisis, I had this clear image that God was doing something through this crisis to prepare us for a destiny after this crisis. The story of Joseph is the one that I've had on my heart in a strong way since all this started about four months ago. If you remember the story of Joseph, he's 17 years old and he has a dream. A dream that God is going to use him. It's a dream of influence, a dream of leadership. But he's not really sure exactly what that looks like. And so he, he doesn't know how to handle this dream. And it's oftentimes when God gives us a God-given strong, big dream, we don't always know how to handle it, how to explain it to others, what it's going to look like. And sometimes we're too immature to handle the weight of a God-given dream. And what God does is what I want to talk to you about. Because I think there's a prophetic message for us as a church. What God does with a young man that has a dream, he prepares him an interesting way. He prepares him through crisis. In fact, God takes this young man with a dream, passion, and he takes him through the worst, most intense, most difficult, draining, upsetting crisis that an individual individual could go through. And it's through the crisis that actually prepares this young Joseph for his powerful destiny. And I've been thinking about this. God, what are you doing? Is it that we, this nation, we as a church, needed to be shaken up in certain areas of our life through this crisis? God, was it, what is it that you're teaching us through pain, difficulty, even death and sickness, upheaval, conversations maybe that we've never had, not being able to meet together as a church. God, what are you teaching us? And Lord, 
I want to make sure that we, as your church, and in particular, New Life Community Church, that we are not deaf, that we're not simply saying, oh God, we can't wait till get back to normal because I don't want to miss what God is teaching us in the middle of crisis just because we long for normal. In fact, I'm praying that we'll never go back to normal. I'm praying that we will engage in a new normal, that God will, that we will embrace the lessons that God has taught us through pain, through tears, through crying out to him, through prayer, through brokenness. And that we as a church on the other side of this crisis will be more prepared to fulfill the mission that God has given us. So I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 37. What is God doing in this crisis? If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Number one, sometimes we need a crisis to prepare us for the challenge of our calling. In Genesis 37, as I said, verse 5, the Bible says that Joseph, and Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Not every God-given dream is going to be accompanied by applauses. Not every God-given dream is going to be understood by the masses. Not every God-given dream is going to make sense to people outside that have not understood, grasped, had the vision of the dream. Joseph knew it was of God, but others didn't. And then God took him through a crisis, as I told you, he took him through his own trilogy of crisis. Crisis number one, his brothers betray him. His own flesh and blood are so angry at the dream that he has, so misunderstand his dream, that they hate him, it says, and they betray him. They concoct a plan to actually kill him, but one of the older brothers has compassion on him, and instead of killing him, they sell him into slavery. But the first crisis is a test of his identity, rejected by his family. The second crisis is he's sold into slavery. That tests his character. He goes from being a free man to now he's someone else's property in another country with a different language. He goes from being a favored son to being a nobody, a piece of property that someone can get rid of whenever they want to, no rights of his own. And then thirdly, he goes into his third crisis where he's thrown into prison, and that's a test of his calling. But I want you to notice this. I want you to notice that God, when God gives him a dream in, in, in chapter 37, it says they hated him and they sold him to the Midianites as a slave, throws, throw him into a cistern. In, in Genesis chapter 39, verse 20, it says, Joseph master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. So like I said, one crisis after another after another. And I asked, but God, what are you doing? As I look at this, I, I believe that it was in crisis that God had to shape the character of Joseph. He discovers skills that he needed in crisis number one, management and leadership. He didn't know how to lead before, and he became the manager of a whole estate. He learned hard work and management and leadership, delegation, and then when he's in prison in crisis number two, he actually discovers that he has a gift that he never had. He's an interpreter of dreams. Oh, don't miss this. Man, I'm talking to someone here. He discovers in crisis some skills that he didn't possess before the crisis. And he discovers in the darkness of the prison some gifting that he never knew he had. Mm. I want you to listen. God is speaking to his church right now. I started thinking about this. And I started thinking of characters in Scripture, and I realized, you know, this is the pattern of God. It's not just isolated to Joseph. I thought of, well, I thought of Moses, who had a calling on his life to be a liberator. And he has to spend 40 years in the desert to get prepared to become the deliverer. 
he thinks that's over. God can't use me anymore. But it's in crisis that God prepares him, and then he has a burning bush experience. I thought of Gideon who has to spend seven years oppressed and beat down by the Midianites, and then God comes and calls a mighty warrior, but he has to be broken down. It's in crisis that he learns the skills that he needs to be that mighty warrior. I think of Jonah, who has a calling of God upon his life to actually turn a city around of Nineveh, but he has to go through, yeah, the belly of a whale and be spit up on the shore before God can really use them. I think of David, called by God, anointed by prophet the Samuel, is told, you're going to be the next king, and then where does David go? Back to serving sheep. To the oblivion where no one knows his name. And then he's faced with the crisis of having to fight a giant named Goliath, the first crisis that enters him into his real calling. I think of the Apostle Paul who gets saved and rejected by the people that he knows and spends 14 years in the desert while God is shaping his character. Crisis. I think of Hannah who has a call of God upon her life and she wants to be a mother and she has to go through the pain, years of suffering with infertility before she gives birth to Samuel the prophet. I think of Abraham, called of God. You're gonna be the father of a great nation. I'm gonna do something. Look at the stars in the sky. Look at the sand beneath you. Hey, you're gonna, a mighty nation is gonna come out of you. But yet two decades later, still no son. Crisis. Shaping, forming, developing our character to prepare us for a time of influence and destiny. I believe that's what God is doing to New Life Community Church. I think of Elisha, who Elijah, his mentor, says, if you're going to have a double portion, I'm going to test it. How bad do you want it? He tests him. He goes through crisis before he gets a double portion of anointing. So, number two, if you're taking notes, write this down. Not only does crisis prepare us for the challenge, but we learn the most at the intersection, hear me well, at the intersection of our greatest trial and God's strongest presence. It's at the intersection where, where, where our trial's the greatest and we sense and know the presence of God the strongest, that's when we learn the greatest lessons. Notice what it says in Genesis chapter 39, verse 3. It says, Joseph is thrown into this trial, this crisis, mega crisis of his life. He's carrying a dream into his crisis. The Bible says in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 39, the Lord was with Joseph. What? Come on. The Lord is with them? And he gets sold into slavery? Just because the Lord is with you does not mean that he will save you from crisis. The Lord was with Joseph and took him into the deepest, darkest crisis of his life. The Lord was with with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with them, even his master, even though he was a nobody slave, saw that the presence of God was with Joseph and that the Lord gave him success in everything that he did. When he was wrongly accused, And the Lord was with them, and he stood up and rejected the advances of Potiphar's wife. He was thrown unjustly in prison. Listen to this, uh, chapter 39, verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. I want you to hear me well. The Lord was with Joseph, and he got sold into slavery. The the Lord was with Joseph, and he got falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. The Lord was with Joseph, and he got thrown into prison. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was forgotten for two years in the prison just because you're going through trial and difficulty and challenge and heartache and grief and injustice doesn't mean that the Lord isn't with you. You see, God can be in the middle of it. Preparing us, shaping us, training us, 
God never promises that we won't go through it, but he does promise that he'll go through it with us. I know I'm talking to someone here that maybe you say, Pastor, this has been the worst season of my life. Maybe you've had someone that have died of COVID-19. Maybe you're depressed because you've been isolated. Maybe your life has been interrupted and you, you, your dreams and plans and future have been put on hold. There's a lot of hurting, grieving people And you could be tempted to think, Lord, where are you in all this? If you were with me, you would have spared me with it. But I want you to know that God was with Joseph, and he took him in the middle of the crisis because God was doing something in him because God wanted to do something through him. I'm convinced, as I said before, that the the learning place is in the intersection between our darkest moment and the deepest presence of God. It's when you're in that dark moment and you find that God is here. You hear the word of God in your darkest moment. You sense the presence of God even though your circumstances don't change. In the middle of some of this calamity and difficulty and people that I knew who were dying and getting sick and I would just felt burdened for our congregation, so many people suffering, I started to read every day Psalms 23. Let me read you, every day I would sit on my couch in the morning and I'd read Psalms 23. Let me tell you, let me, let me just read you this. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, uh, King James says the valley of, of death, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Hey, I'm still walking through the valley, but the difference is I'm experiencing your presence while I do it. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God was with them. They were thrown in the furnace of fire, and as they were in their deepest, darkest moment in the middle of the furnace, uh, they saw a fourth man that appeared to be like the Son of God. In other words, they were in the fire, but the presence of God was with them. That was a breakthrough moment for them. That was a moment that changed everything, that they knew it was the darkest moment, yet the presence of God was with them in the darkest moment. That's when they learned. That's when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego discovered, hey, God is with us. There's a power beyond us. We are prepared to believe God for greater things because in our darkest moment, we have known the fidelity of God, the faithfulness, the power, the compassion, the strength of our mighty God. Oh, man, I'm, I wish I could preach this better, but it's powerful. Number three, not only does crisis prepare us for the challenge. Number two, we learn the most at the intersection of our greatest trial and our strongest presence. And number three, at the end of crisis, It's those who have learned lessons and purified their hearts that God uses. It tells us in verse 19, after the crisis was coming to an end, and Joseph has been raised to a place of power, of influence. I want you to hear hear me well what what it says. It says in, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19, Joseph could have become bitter because his brothers had sold him into slavery. Potiphar's wife had had falsely accused him. I mean, he had a lot of people to bring vengeance on because the crisis had been brutal to Joseph. But the Bible says, but Joseph said to his brothers who had betrayed him, sold him, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Listen, you intended this to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Are you hearing me? Did you hear what happened here? Joseph is saying, listen, I'm not going to become bitter. It's been difficult. I've grieved. I've mourned. I've lost things in the middle of the crisis. It's been hard, but I will not let my heart become bitter or resentful or angry at people, even in the midst of the crisis. 
because I know that God has been using the crisis to prepare me for such a time as this. And he says, even what you meant for evil, God is used for good. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. What you meant for evil, God meant for good, the saving of many lives. Man, I hope, I hope you're getting that message here. Some of you, we as a church, New Life Community Church, the church across America, the church across the globe, and so many others, we've been in the midst of a mega crisis. But I believe there's lessons that God is teaching us. And as I've been thinking about this, we can get bitter or we can get better through this. And I want you to notice that God stirred up a problem in the palace while he creates a solution in the prison that opens up the door to a new powerful position. Joseph went on to the most influential season of his life. He saved his family, saved a nation, influenced people, uh, prepared for a famine. Why? Because God had taken him through a crisis where he learned skills and he discovered gifts because God, God had taken him through that. He's no longer a cocky 17-year-old kid. He's a man that's been through a crisis. He's now 30 years old. And can I say that God may be preparing us even right now as a church and as a people for our greatest season of influence, not, be, not because we went through a crisis, but because how we handle the crisis we're going through. What have we been learning I've been thinking about that. God, what are you teaching us that at the end of this crisis, when all is said and done, could help us accomplish our God-given mission in more accelerated fashion than ever? We started praying quite a few years ago, God, let us influence 1% of the city of Chicago. Can I, can I 1% of the city of Chicago is 30,000 people. Can I just tell you something that struck me the other day and someone brought it to my attention? We started to do a food distribution, giving food to people that were in need, and God blessed it and increased it. Someone told me that two weeks ago, we fed 30,000 people. And they said that number, and I thought, whoa, whoa, hold on. We fed 30,000 people in Chicago, and our doors are closed? And we can't even have services, yet we're influencing 30,000 people? Come on, people of God. God is preparing us. So, so let, me, let me just wrap this up and tell you quickly. Listen, this health care crisis, I believe that God has taught us that our buildings our buildings were shut down, but we learned that our congregation is much more than a Sunday morning gathering, that we are an unstoppable people filled with the power of God, and that our ministry exists as much out of the building as in the building. Do not limit God to a Sunday morning service. We started gathering in homes. We held services online. We became active through the week. Many of our locations started daily, pr uh, daily prayer meetings where people from all, all over, saved and unsaved, joined us for those prayer meetings. People got baptized outside in the street. I saw someone get baptized in a little village in the corner. I saw people get baptized here in the parking lot of Midway. I saw someone at the beginning get baptized in Lake Michigan. Why? Because God cannot be contained in four walls of a church. We are the church church, with or without the building, in or out of the building, seven days a week, not an hour and a half on Sunday morning. God taught us some things about that. In financial crisis, he taught us that we can meet needs and partner for the good of our city. It started out with feeding some people in Little Village with Matt DiMatteo and, and New Life Centers and, and uh, Josiah and Matt got together and Josh Hollick and said, hey, how can we spread this to others and created some partnerships and, and now seven locations around the city are feeding with hundreds of volunteers. We have had politicians come out here, city officials come out here, and they all say it's amazing. Well, all these volunteers, why do they show up? They show up because they love Jesus. They show up because we're the people of God. 
They show up because the gospel is, first of all, bringing people into right relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, but the gospel is not fully completed unless we bring transformation to the neighborhood in which we live. We bring a culture because we're saved. It's not just personal sanctification. It's also cultural transformation where the people of God rise up by the power of God and do good works, a city on a hill that cannot be ignored. We took up an offering and collected $70,000 in the middle of an economic crisis, the generosity of the people of God. We've had for two and a half months food distribution, lines of people. I've prayed over people that don't come to church. Uh, just at our Midway campus, we normally have about 1,600 people that attend on Sunday morning. On Saturdays, we've been having 3,000 people, mainly non-believers, in our parking lot. Wow. And I've had the opportunity to pray with so many of them. I had an opportunity to pray with a woman uh, not too long ago. I poked my head and said, are you surviving this crisis okay? And she pointed to her 30-year-old daughter who had no hair on her head, and she said she's in the middle of chemo. And I said, I could tell they weren't really Christians. I said, can I pray? Would you mind if I prayed? She said, sure. So I, I had a Holy Spirit boldness to pray for hope into her daughter's life who's in chemo, that God would give her a vision of the future, that God would release healing into her body, that she would not go into despair. When I opened up my eyes afterwards, this is in the, this is in the food distribution line, they both had tears running down their face, and I thought, the gospel, Jesus Mother Teresa said, we know only too well that what we are doing is nothing more than a drop in the ocean, but if the drop were not there, the ocean would be missing something. I love that. During the racial crisis with global tension, we've been learning too. We've been learning that we need to lead the way in showing the world what a society should look like that comes together, breaking down racial barriers. We're learning as a church that we need to listen better. We're learning as a church that we need to be aware of the injustice and inequalities that exist in a city like ours in Chicago. We're learning that we should lead the way, that society should be looking at us to say, how do you do it? The society should be looking at the church and saying, you know what, society's divided, there's racial inequalities, but we see a beauty in the church that we don't have and we want to learn from it. It's forced us to have conversations that maybe should have been had a long time ago. It showed us, to, it's, it's helped us look at ourselves once again. We're learning, people of God. These crises are preparing us. They're preparing us. So when this crisis is over, we will have been changed in a better way to accomplish the purposes of God. And I'll close with this. I believe this is a prophetic word. I don't like the crisis, the trilogy, but I embrace it. And I don't want to go through this pain, this difficulty. I don't want to go through this hardship without walking away, not having learned some powerful, powerful lessons as a church. One of my favorite stories was from a 14-year-old girl about her experience at New Life. I'm going to read something that she wrote for a school project. She said, this year has been very rough year for all of us. Our lives have been changed one way or another in a matter of minutes. We all have been impacted by COVID-19. I have seen how a particular church has come out and shown empathy to not only their church, but to the community. New Life Montclair in Chicago has been a blessing not only to my family and I, but to many families. I have seen with my own eyes how much love this church has when we go get food. The love they have for people that no matter if you go to their church or not, they are there to help by giving you food. Only God does things like that. 
Man, when a 14-year-old girl that doesn't go to church starts saying, only God does stuff like that. When people in a parking lot say, when this is over, I want to go to your church. When in Little Village, black and brown are marching together for unity because the work of the people of God building bridges. And there's something we're learning, church. Something deep, powerful, profound. That when this is said and done, we should never go back to normal. We should walk into this new crisis with a new set of skills, a new set of gifting, a new passion, a new burden, a new influence in our society. Because God has taken us into crisis to accelerate our dream and vision of influencing and impacting the fabric of this city for the glory of King Jesus. I'm glad I'm on this journey with you proud of you, church. Let's learn together. Let's change this city because God has shaped us through crisis. Let's not forget what God is teaching us. You know, one of the ways that we show unity and we point to the gospel is through an act that's been done for 2,000 years. It talks about unity of the body but it talks about the centrality of the gospel. We call it communion. We're gonna end this service by celebrating communion together. We're not in the same auditorium, but wherever house you're in, whatever car you're in, I'm gonna ask that you participate with us. And Pastor Josiah is gonna help us in this service with communion. You know, Jesus established the practice of communion 2,000 years ago. And he taught us to follow a pattern. A pattern and a practice that was born out of an action. Not only that he first modeled, but in the life that he gave. And communion is a powerful moment when the church gets together and remembers the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross on our behalf. And the bread, the bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for us. And the juice or the wine represents the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. And every time the church comes together and does communion like this, and let me just say, I think there's no better time to do communion. An act of unity, an act of remembering what Jesus has done, an act of remembering who we are as a body, than right now in a time where our country, our city, our state, our world is so divided. Jesus, died on the cross on our behalf. And the thing that unites us more than our political party, more than our neighborhood, more than our race, and more than even the country that, we are, that we're a part of is the work of Jesus upon the cross. That should be the flag that we wave more than any other flag is the wave of, uh, of the flag of what Jesus has done on the cross and how no matter what color we are, what background we're from, what neighborhood we live in or we were raised in, what money or wealth you have to your name, what country you're a part of, what location you attend. There's something so powerful when we know that the greatest thing that unites us and brings us together is what Jesus has done on the cross. And because of what Jesus has done on the cross, we are made new. We are washed clean. We are made a family together. And so if you've gathered your elements for communion, 
you can get your bread or your cracker or your bread like cracker like thing and if you want to break it and father we love you we're committed to you we take a moment to remember that your body was broken on our behalf for us you were broken so that we could be fixed and so we partake in eating this symbol of your body this bread and remember your body that was broken on the cross on our behalf and you could go ahead and eat right now the bread And you can grab the wine or the juice. And I want you to take a moment before we pray and remember the blood that was shed for you and I. That took you from where you were, the deep, dark pit, entangled with your sin, trapped in your old desires, a slave to sin. And Jesus came and died on the cross for you and I so that we can be united by his blood by what he did on the cross, that we could be united and be one body before him. And so as we drink today and remember what Jesus did, let me pray. Father, we thank you for your blood that was shed on the cross on our behalf. We know that it's because of your stripes that we're, we are healed, that because your blood was shed on the cross, we are washed before the eyes of Almighty God that we are cleansed, that we don't have to feel ashamed or be condemned because you don't condemn us, but we are washed and covered and we are united by a blood and an action that was done 2,000 years ago. And we are part of your family, a royal divine family, and we'll spend all eternity with you. And so in this broken and divided world that we live in, we drink this as a symbol together to show that we as the church will be united in a divided time. And as you finish drinking, we're going to take a moment to finish in a worship song. But don't lose the essence of this moment and remembering what Jesus has done and the power that is found in his spirit and how we are one through his action. Let's sing. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing.
Wow, what an amazing time of praise and worship. Our God is faithful. If you felt encouraged by the worship, by the message today, or if you gave your life to Christ, let us know down below so we can reach out to you. We are here for you. We love you. And I hope that you have a blessed Sunday. We'll see you here again next week.